אז uh, באמת אני אעבור עכשיו, uh, yeah, אני אעבור לאנגלית, so I'd like to welcome Patrick German uh, from uh, EPFL, Patrick um, coordinates the learning uh, technology and innovation in EPFL and he will share with us um, the experience that they've had over the last two or three years in trying to maintain the connection with students, support, assessment, and informal learning. So, Patrick, thank you very much, and, and over to you. Well, thanks, Ishay, for the invitation and the introduction. And indeed, I'll, I'll try to share a little piece of the story that EPFL went through for this COVID adventure. Um, and so to start, maybe a little bit of background about EPFL. So it's a science and engineering school, um, which is traditionally providing on-campus education to about 12,000 students. And so the picture you see here is what most of the instruction consists of. So you have students sitting in an auditorium, um, especially in the first year, of course, and the teacher is writing stuff on the blackboard you have lectures and exercises. And then later on in the curriculum, you also, of course, have laboratory work. Our typical first year student schedule is full of lectures and exercises, up to 30 or even a bit more hours per week. And so when you told me, Shay, well, we are interested in, in informal learning. Um, at the beginning, there is not much space for this. Of course, there is. Um, students work another 30 hours at home, in groups, in the library, um, in the corridors, everywhere. So it, it happens, but it's not a, a big part of the official curriculum, let's say. Studies are very much uh, canned, organized, and timetabled at EPFL. And so in this context, of course, this happened <laughs> and everybody had to go home um, and react really quickly as everywhere to try to continue uh, teaching. The, the very first thing we did as a team uh, is to merge with the digital education team and the teacher support team. We became one team that was the first result of of the of the crisis and we developed a whole lot of um, documentation uh, giving roadmaps and strategies to apply to replace lectures exercises projects and labs we also produced a whole lot of quick start guides you know how to use zoom for somebody who never used it and then a few weeks later we started collecting uh, best practice from the teachers and developed a few use cases where we describe from a peer to other peers what has worked and what didn't work. So I heard just before, although I don't speak Hebrew, that people were mentioning uh, different types of tools. And I think this is a bit like everywhere. Uh, we had a whole array of tools that were used. Uh, Mostly, I think people used what existed already. Uh, if I look at all the startups that we have around campus who were trying to promote their new tool and so on, there was really little uptake. People were just, you know, uh, switching back to, to what they had already in their tool set. And for us, we produced already more than 100 MOOCs by the 2020. And so all the teachers who had a MOOC already running on Coursera or edX were able to say, okay, well, the lecture is there. I will now organize some live sessions for exercises. And all the live stuff, the lectures and it, the exercises were happening via Zoom, most of it. And so this is not the topic today, but we recorded and indexed an amazing amount of videos. So two years of online lecturing are now available for the students as a library of, of knowledge. And that was really a big opportunity, I think, that the, the COVID crisis has given is that we have constituted this um, uh, huge library. 
Now for the exercise, so we have Moodle, uh, 1,500 courses on Moodle. This is the learning management system everyone is using. And then for the exercises, which is a bit more the topic of today, that was very difficult because in exercise sessions, usually students work in small groups of uh, eight students. They have a dedicated tutor and there they really can, you know, interact and solve the problems together. And that was not possible anymore. And so we had three main tools that were tried out. Uh, Piazza, which is a forum tool specialized on for education. Slack, which is more the business version of it, where, you know, we use it, especially in computer science, as a way to keep a team up to date, exchange ideas and coordinate people. And then Discord, which is the student's choice. Uh, my kids who are 18, they hang out on Discord in the evening. And so that's the natural way for them to share stuff. And so some we have some people who use all of these tools um, we are now focusing a bit more on piazza as you know the institutional tool institutionally supported tool that will stay later on there are other tools there are many i just listed a few it was really uh, difficult to keep track and actually students complained that they have too many tools because if you have 10 lectures in a week, each teacher uses two different tools. Imagine uh, how many logins and the places you have to, to, to get somewhere. And so there was really a request also coming from the students to keep Moodle as the main entry point. They would like to have one place where you find everything which is related to uh, education. I'll share with you now, um, a few results from two surveys we've done after maybe six months into the pandemic and the first survey was for teachers and we asked them uh, what works we called it flexible teaching right so, so in other places it, it's called high flex it's a mix sometimes we were completely remote in other times we were one third of the students on campus and two thirds at home and so when asked about what worked, most positive responses came about the video recordings that the teachers found really useful. Um, and the most negative comments were about the lack of presence. So everyone was missing physical contact with the students. Sometimes it's not easy to understand what exactly is so good, because if you stand in front of 200 people, you don't have that much physical contact, but there is this, yeah, just the, the, the lack of, of human presence. And then, of course, during the break, students can ask questions. And, and, and so this was what was missing most. Forums were also cited, but you see 37 positive comments out of 300. It's not like a, a plebiscite for uh, forums, but still little by little uh, forums and chats were uh, seen as useful, especially to connect the, the in-campus lecture with the people at home. So many teachers would designate one teaching assistant to monitor uh, a chat system to be able to uh, have the questions from remote being answered in the on-campus. That was one use of forums and chats, and the other one was more for the exercise sessions. On the student side, we also did a survey of students and asked them what is important for learning. And the top three elements were the, I want a recording of the class. I want to be able to do exercises, and I want to be able to ask questions to the teachers. And I think this is also where we will see most potential for forums and online discussion tools, because asking a question online is often more easy than asking it in the auditorium. Students are quite shy to, at least here in Switzerland, to you know raise their hands in front of 100 people and ask a question. On a forum, it's much easier. 
But then also when we look at the comments of the students about you know what is essential to to learn, we the interaction with peers comes quite far. Only few cite this. What's most important is having access to live exercise sessions to ask teaching assistants. And then still students say, you know, it was hard on all aspects, right? Uh, they, they could follow the courses more or less well. The exercises were more difficult. Here you see 60% uh, of the students disagree with the idea that they can follow the exercises well. And also 60% say they cannot interact enough with other students. Although they don't cite this really in the comments, but let's say in the survey, they really identify this. After one year or one year and a half, our boss, the Associate Vice President for Education, uh, created three commissions to think about. We talked just before we started the session about the new normal, you know. So, what will stay after COVID? What have we learned? And I was coordinating a commission called the Flexible Teaching and Learning or the Hybrid Education Commission. And we came up with a series of recommendations based on what worked well, what didn't work. And uh, you see them listed here. Um, all the good stuff that we are thinking about uh, in, as pedagogues, you know, uh, more flexible course organization, more independent work, active learning, and things like this. And then the recommendation three, to promote asynchronous feedback more. So to extend the moments where teachers and students interact outside of the official timetable time. And that's where we are now pushing for the adoption of a, of a forum uh, tool to implement this. This is the detail of this asynchronous feedback. So, you know, if students are not on campus all the time, you have a mix of online and remote, uh, online and on in presence learning. Uh, there is a need for an additional channel, which actually keeps a trace of the interactions between teaching assistant and students and allows um, uh, interaction without being live. And so we're currently doing this, identifying and selecting a chat and forum tool um, to allow to implement extended uh, office hours. Of course, this has also implications in terms of the teaching assistants. Somebody has to pay them. And if they're supposed to work two hours and now we need four, that's also a challenge we have to look at. So our favorite tool that we're looking at right now, we're looking at, at, at different options, is called Piazza. Maybe not everyone knows this tool, so I show it to you here. Um, it has a bit uh, 80s, 1980s look. <laughs> and I thought uh, the students would not like it very much, but actually students like it quite a lot because um, it is faster in response time than Moodle, for example. And I think this is not necessarily due to the tool. This is due also to the organization that was put in place by the teachers and the teaching assistants who are monitoring these forums much more actively than what they would be doing with Moodle before the pandemic. Something else which is really appreciated by students is the fact that you can post anonymously. So you can ask your question and the instructors still could see who it is. You know, if somebody posts inappropriate content, I mean, you, you can uh, uncover who it is, but to other students, if you post in there, you appear as anonymous. Another interesting feature is the bit original format. When somebody asks a question, you have one answer that is worked on by several students collaboratively. So a first one gives a le an element of answer, and then others can build on top of this answer. And at some point, the teaching assistants either validate the student answer or answer themselves. 
And this format works quite nicely. Actually, I've talked to about 10 professors about how it's used. Some students get really involved in answering uh, questions from other students. And these are then hired as teaching assistants later. Um, and the use of these forums is, is quite intense. Uh, throughout the semester, teachers create uh, little categories. Here you see cours chapitre zero means the course first chapter. Then you have the exercise series. You have chapter one, two, three, and so on. So the, the discussion is organized according to the structure of the course. And, and it, it, it kind of works, which is surprising because I've been at EPFL for almost 20 years. And for the past 18 years, forums never worked. You know, you, people have a forum in Moodle, nobody asks a question in there. And now we see, oh, actually, it, sometimes it works. And what's interesting is that this shows the number of courses we have on, on Piazza before COVID. So you have a few enthusiastic model teachers, <laughs> 10, who use it. And then oh, it goes up for two remote semesters, up to 70, 80 courses. And what's interesting is that the last semester was on campus and it stayed. So uh, teachers continued using um, uh, Piazza on campus. Of course, 80 courses out of 800 is still not a broad coverage, but as often with these innovations, if you can demonstrate the value of it and show use cases to other professors, I think it's a good start to try to convince more um, teachers to use this tool. So this is what is on my table now. We ha I have a few other concurrents, but as I said, these different systems have different primary uses. And you have some systems that are built for education as a forum. Others, Discord comes from the gamer community. You have Slack as a business app, and more and more you see also Zoom or video-based tools who try to enter the supporting education market. So you start with video and you add chat, or you start with a chat and you add videos. Everyone starts to offer a bit the same um, set of functionalities. For us, two of the really important factors are the fact to have anonymous posts, because this really increases participation of students. And because it's a science and engineering school, people want to write math. So either they, they take a picture of handwriting, or when they are a bit more advanced, they use the LaTeX uh, notation. Another important aspect is, of course, the data protection policy where is the data of our students stored? Are there uh, suitable privacy policies in place and so on? And this is a bit the room in which we, we navigate. Of course, Moodle integration as well is something important. We don't want a tool where people need yet another um, login. I'll finish up with two um, examples of things we, we have done in, in parallel um, to just providing forums. One was the, the fact that we, we think students need a learning network. When they are on campus, they make friends, they have little study groups and so on, and that was lost during the pandemic. We already had coaches who welcome students in the beginning of the studies, tell them when there is the, the party, uh, you know, uh, facilitate the socializing. We had tutors who were assisting students in exercise sessions to give math and physics expertise. And what was created during COVID was mentors. And mentors where their job was to help sustain motivation and help organize studies. So make sure people are able to find help when they need. Make sure they are able to keep up with the incredible pace of online lectures and so on. And so we had one mentor for 10 students, four weeks per week. 
and that worked pretty well. Um, it was useful, especially at the beginning. It was reassuring students. Um, what was a bit more difficult is that they tended to become tutors. So from just helping the metacognitive par part of education, like the organization, self-regulation, they became more uh, content experts. And with time, you have a bit unbalanced groups because some people don't use the resource that much anymore. So we're thinking about sustaining this. This is also a way to encourage the creation of study groups and informal learning later on. And the other thing we're doing, this looks a lot like the slides you showed in the beginning, Ishe, is rethink a bit the, the use of the space. Because hopefully the COVID period has allowed us to see the potential for more independent asynchronous work, for more uh, self-study in a way. And this, of course, has also to, to be made to be enabled on campus with appropriate study rooms. And so we're thinking about we have a few um, buildings that need to be renovated right now, and we're full in the reflection of how to reorganize space, maybe a little bit away from large auditoriums. We still need some for large lectures, but then um, uh, try, try to invent rooms where you can work independently, do exercises, and be a bit more flexible with this regard. So that was a bit my overview of what happened at EPFL with regards to uh, student interaction in, in supporting them. I list here all the other things we're doing. I'll distribute the slides if you're interested so you can look at these other things I didn't talk about today. Thanks a lot. Isha, you're muted. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Patrick. I think that was you know, very, very interesting and kind of inspiring. And, and it's good to see uh, first that, you know, as I was saying earlier, that some of the um, issues that we're dealing with here, you know, where it's not just in our sort of remote end of the world, but even uh, in, um, you know, a, a big institution like EPFL, you're, you're kind of dealing with the same challenges. And, and it's very interesting to see how you you respond to these challenges. I um, particularly like the fact that, you know, that you introduced the Piazza forms for, for as a response to COVID and they stayed. And now, you know, you, you have pretty much the same level of, in, of usage that you had during COVID when you come back to the classrooms. Um, I, I had a question about the mentors that you mentioned. Are those mentors, uh, students, or are they sort of more the profile of teaching assistants, or how, how do you select the mentors? Um, yeah, they are students, so more advanced students, uh, a bit later on in their studies, and we train them. So they, they receive a training in um, managing a, a, a group, you know, how to um, uh, support uh, group work and and how to, uh, we, we rely a lot on, on a booklet called Apprendre à étudier, learning to learn, you know, mm. that lists a bit the good learning habits. Um, and we mm. built a tool on top of this as well. Uh, and, and so we, we try to train them a bit so they can be relays for mm. um, these aspects. That's interesting, because I know a few uh, institutions here in Israel uh, initiated something like that. So again, mm, Instead of, you know, we have teaching assistants who help the lecture and we have learning assistants, which are more advanced students that, as, as you say, get some training, especially in, in you know, in kind of good learning habits and so on, and, and they support their fellow students. Now, I'd like to open the floor now for uh, questions. Um, uh, whoever has any questions for, for Patrick, please um, come forward. Um, if if you want, if you un feel uncomfortable with the English, you can also ask in Hebrew in the chat, and I'll translate. 
I just if I I mean just a comment. Um, thank you first of all for the talk. It was so good to hear that, and I I have so many notes to take back. Uh, you know, to talk with my team. I just I just wanted to say that when you were talking about all the different uh, platforms. You know, so we, we get so, I'll talk about my team, we got so excited. So we had, you know, Padlets and Perusal and forums and share documents on Google. And, and even when we had it all on Moodle, students still said, I don't know what the hell is going on. And so we had to kind of take a deep breath and go, okay, we're getting overexcited and we really need to rethink how we focus this for them so they're not completely overwhelmed by you're saying this login and this. So, so that, that was just one thing that jumped out at me that, you know, maybe a similar experience as, as our students. Yeah, I think there is also the diversity of how the tools are used. Uh, I mean, even the, the, the course formats are very different from one to the other. We have a few teachers who adopt now flipped classrooms for example, and there also it really needs to to adapt to this new way of doing, um, and and so students have have to deal with this diversity. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, I find it that I I always like using a lot of different tools um, in in my teaching, and even if I don't use too many tools but the tools i use are, are not familiar to the students from other courses and i say they have to deal with a triple shock you know they enter the course they have to deal with new content new pedagogy and new tools so what i learned is to do them not all in the same time but kind of you know first start with familiar tools and new pedagogy and then add the tools or or start with you know, just a, a kind of an ice-breaking session with, with the new tools and then bring in the pedagogy and the content. Uh, but yes, it's it's uh, the, the tool, tool overload is definitely an issue. Um, any, anybody else wants to comment or, or ask a question? Yeah, um, can I ask a question? Yes, of uh, course. Um, first of all, yeah, it was a great, uh, presentation. Uh, Can you just I mean, introduce yourself, oh, Yossi, sorry. So yeah, I'm uh, Yossi Elran. Uh, I head the Innovation Center of Science Education at the uh, Davidson Institute of Science Education in Israel, uh, which is the education along of the Whitehead Institute of Science. Um, uh, first of all, it was a great talk. Um, I learned a lot. I'd like to ask about the uh, teacher's side and uh, creating um, you know these. How how did the teachers? I know you. I know you showed a slide, but uh, one of the one of the problems, for instance, in uh, especially in Moodle, is that um, the teachers find it very hard to do things other than just uh, post uh, videos there or pages. Do you, do you have that problem, or do you have uh, um, do, do your teachers uh, or lecturers? Um, can they can they, are they can they uh, use Moodle with, with all its functionality? No, so this this hasn't changed much, uh, I must admit. So if you look at the use of Moodle, it's a lot about distributing documents. So the lecture slides, the exercises and the solutions. And now they were also posting the videos, but all, all the quizzes uh, you know, that you could do to, to give opportunities to students to check their knowledge and all that stuff is not used a lot. And that's one of the challenges. When we design MOOCs, we do the perfect course. You have quizzes, assignments, content, everything is there, but it's a huge investment uh, of time in designing the course. And so it's it's one of the challenges is how how to bring that type of, of practice to more to to Moodle. We have we have some who, who do it, but if you look at the statistics over all the courses, how many use a quiz? It's a, a, a thin proportion. And your MOOCs, excuse me, uh, your MOOCs uh, uh, that you design, you de you design them on 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 Moodle, or you have your own platform? No, <clears throat> so we are both um, using Coursera and edX. 
and we also have a local installation which is called the Swiss MOOC service. It's for Swiss universities or any university actually uh, who, who wishes to distribute MOOCs. It's compatible with the edX uh, course format. Yeah, that, that's similar to, to the case here. We have a, a kind of a national edX server, which is called Campus IL, and yes. uh, we had a government program to encourage institutions to develop and, and uh, MOOCs on that platform. And then other institutions have uh, MOOCs on FutureLearn, and Coursera and so on. Yeah. I was wondering about uh, Piazza. So, if I understand, Piazza is is mainly a forum tool, but you can also uh, add resources there, right? And so, if lecturers are using Moodle predominantly to share resources, um, do you see a situation where they use Piazza as you know as a substitute, a full substitute for the LMS? Or they still use uh, Moodle for everything else and then just have the conversations on Piazza? So the, I haven't seen much uploading of um, content in, in Piazza. I think it's really foremost a, a, a forum tool. So Moodle will stay. But some teachers use it. There is a live Q&A mode um, that some teachers use when during a live lecture so mm -hmm. that students can post instead of the zoom chat for example and it also allows to do polling so you can mm. ask a little question that could replace clicker um, mm. systems where where you do a live response system in in the mm -hmm. class so it, it supports a few of these um, now I, yeah, what we will try to do is, is provide training and information about how to implement most of the features in this same tool. But then it's, you know, every, everyone has their own little recipe. And it's difficult once you've done pasta bolognese your way, it's difficult to learn how to do it differently. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. Okay, thank you. So uh, again, any more questions or, or comments or if somebody wants to i don't know if uh, i wonder if um anybody is using piazza in their institution is there anybody has any experience with using piazza i i will now definitely open and look into it it's i'm very curious but no i have i have we have not at the technique i mean not not in english studies teaching mm -hmm. anyway i don't know about the rest of the technique so Sharon is saying that she's seen, Sharon, do you want to uh, share with us or should I translate your... your... You can translate for me. Uh, so Sharon says that you've seen courses that are conducted almost entirely on Piazza and the only thing that they leave in Moodle is the assignments because obviously assignments and official kind of formal assessment I don't know if you can submit an assignment on Piazza. No. But no. everything else you can do. It, it's really, for, I see it as a replacement for the Moodle forum. So, so it's, it's really oriented towards uh, textual discussion. Um, it's between... excellent as a forum. And uh, many students use it, especially before the exam, the final exam. It's an excellent tool. And also, it uh, saves uh, answering the same question 100 times in your email. So one <laughs> student answers, and then you refer everyone to the answer. And I saw many lecturers that chose to conduct the entire course uh, there, except for the submission that you can't do there. So they posted like... everything there, all the resources and everything, and they never even looked in Moodle. Mm -hmm. So it looks like we have a local expert on Piazza. So uh, <laughs> if, if it's okay with you, Sean, we'll, we'll be happy to you know, talk to you later and, and uh, sure. you know, refer anyone who, who wants to try out Piazza to you for, for kind of the local know-how. Um, 
thank you. Thank you for, for that contribution. So anybody else, again, any more questions or comments or anybody? So I, I again, so Sharon says she's been using Piazza or they've been using Piazza in her college. Um, anybody else has experience with this too? You can just raise a hand if you want or wave. Uh, anybody thinking of trying it out after this uh, exposure? I mean, Orit said she is, yes. Uh, Zevi, I don't know if you're nodding or, yeah. <laughs> Good. Um, great. So so you say, uh, so in Reichmann, you say it's used in all the mathematics courses. So I guess that's, again, makes sense with the, um, LaTeX integration because I don't think Moodle form supports LaTeX, right? Yes, um, you have a supplement that I know that is called the Wiris, I think, and mm -hmm. that supports uh, math. But uh, in Discord, for example, there's no such thing as you said. But... Yeah, yeah. Okay, and and one more question, Patrick. So you mentioned that you were that. Snack is used in in the engineering and computer science degrees, and that makes sense in terms of the interface with the industry. And that Discord is used by the students, so the Discord servers are set up by students uh, as a kind of a back channel without the official intervention of of the EPFL. Or you also have you tried Discord as as an official channel. So I don't know exactly how students communicate with each other, to be honest. I know, I know they have WhatsApp channels. Uh, they probably have Discord uh, groups. Um, I've heard of a, few exp of a few teachers who have set up a Discord site for their course. Mm -hmm. And so there mm -hmm. it, it was instructor led, if you want. And um, so, but I, I don't have numbers about mm -hmm how often that was used it, it was one of the tools that came up when uh -huh. we asked you know how how do you uh, what tools are you using yeah to, to be fair i actually so i have a, a friend the close friend whose son studies at epfl and from him i heard that you know now he spends all day on discord well he used to spend all day on discord before for gaming and now he says that he does it for his studies so that uh, i guess either uh, there are quite a few courses uh, that have set up discord servers or maybe he's just using it as an excuse <laughs> <laughs> okay thank you any more uh, can, just, uh, i just something i've been i've been thinking about is you you have been talking i the Moodle, I also find it, and I know my teachers as well, is not the most friendly, almost, something very strict about it. And at the same time, the students are enrolled there automatically. So it's it's institutional in terms of its representation. Like, who is Moodle? It's the institution. And what I like about bringing in these outside things, formats, and what I like about Discord, and that's why, I'm, is that there's something very informal about it. And so the type of conversation that I as a lecturer can have with my students differs greatly if it's an email I'm sending them officially through Moodle or even setting up a forum, and when I'm having a conversation with them somewhere else. It's almost like you were saying, Patrick, having a conversation in the classroom when someone comes up to you and it becomes really unofficial or they catch you when you've just left the classroom. There's something about the physicality of where I am having this conversation. And so I feel like Moodle and Discord kind of mirror those, how official are we talking right now? Right, yeah. so. So maybe we need a kind of a gradient of, of different spaces from the complete, like, you know, submitting an assignment is very official it's part of your grade and then in the forum it's slightly more relaxed and you, especially if you can post anonymous questions like in in um piazza and then discord or whatsapp group or so on which is totally unofficial um i used to have whatsapp groups for my courses alongside the moodle forum and I would tell my students, I 
imagine that you also have another WhatsApp group without me, and that's perfect. I, I, I encourage that. You know, I think there's also the spaces which we don't see that are part of, of their learning experience. Okay, thank you. Um, so again, any more any more questions or comments? Um, so I think um, this is time to to say a big thank you, Patrick. Uh, it was a pleasure having you with us today, and I'll just you know make a note of that slide, the last slide you had, because it's almost like an agenda for our future conversation. I think each one of those projects looks interesting. Um, I'll also catch up with you about. You, the, the one after that where you were talking about uh, designing new physical spaces, uh, we've been looking into that here as well. Zevi has been doing a lot of work on that recently, right? So, uh, so we maybe will also catch up on that later. So thank you very much now. And thank you. See you and, soon. And have a good and day. Thank you. <laughs>